Okay, I want to welcome everyone to Museum Studies' fifth webinar of 2023, Risk-Based Approaches to Preventive Conservation, Which to Choose for My Situation. I'm Brad Breedyhoff with Museum Study. Museum Study provides online professional development for people who work with cultural institutions. I see a few familiar faces here, like Dee, who has taken our classes in the past. Um, and I want to welcome all of you. Um, Today's presentation will be by one of our instructors, Robert Waller, who is president and senior risk analyst at Protect Heritage Corp. Author of more than 25 scientific and technical papers, chapters, or books on conservation, Robert Waller has taught, lectured, and served as a consultant at dozens of museums, universities, and organizations throughout North and South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. For some reason, he skipped Antarctica. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> His doctoral thesis from Gopeborg University in 2003, Cultural Property Risk Analysis Model, was considered groundbreaking and has since changed the way museum collection professionals plan strategically and set priorities. Rob leads two courses for us on assessing risk to cultural property. In the first one, Assessing Risk to Cultural Property 1, participants develop a useful set of defined type 1, rare and potentially catastrophic specific risks relevant to their institution. The potential impact of those risks is ranked according to estimates of likelihood and impact. This provides focus in the development of emergency preparedness plans and resources. This course will run next in October, so next month. Also with us today is Moya Dumbbell, a paper conservator and risk analysis advisor at Protect Heritage, as well as a professor of conservation at the Fleming College Cultural Heritage Conservation and Management Program. We are excited to have such a large group of you from all manner of cultural institutions and collections. More than 80 participants signed up to join us today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. I will send a link to the recording to all who registered for today's webinar. And I will also send out um, the links that Rob provided for me to drop in the chat during this session. So um, those will be sent out to you so you don't necessarily need to capture them while we're talking. Please mute yourself during the presentation, um, but feel free to use the chat window to ask any questions you have as they occur to you while he's presenting. And then during the Q&A, Rob will answer those questions. And if you want, you can also unmute at that time and ask any questions that you have. And with that, I will let you get started, Rob. Great, thank you very much, Brad. And um, thank you everybody for participating with us here. It's uh, really nice to be able to present um, in, in this kind of virtual way and, and capture so many people. So my title may be just a titch different than what I gave Brad a few months ago, uh, Reducing Risk to Collections, Different Approaches for Different Contexts. And uh, today is the day I'm in the right place at the right day. That's always a good idea. And myself, I, I do work with museum studies, as Brad said. My main uh, gig is with Protect Heritage Corp, but I'm also a research associate with the Canadian Museum of Nature, um, adjunct assistant professor with Queen's University Art Conservation. And this year and next year uh, with the Society for Risk Analysis, I'm the chair of the Applied risk management specialty group. So keep myself hopping in retirement. Um, the outline for today is just a really brief outline. Uh, diversity in risk terminology I want to touch on with a couple of slides. Simplicity and sophistication in approaches to risk just understanding that there's a range, a really brief history of risk and preventive conservation. And then the bulk is a focus on QuizScan, ABC, and CPRAM, and some of their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and what this means for preventive conservation is how we'll end up, because I think there's some really significant lessons here for how we as a field look at developing um, our abilities to serve all of our clients. So let's start with diversity in risk terminology. And here, 
we have terms like risk analysis. It, Brad, is this coming through all right? Just want to make sure people are seeing things. Or have I shared my screen? You, you have not shared your screen yet, Rob. Oh, isn't that funny? Okay, good thing I checked. <laughs> Let's um uh, but I won't bother repeating what I'm saying, but I'll definitely share my screen. Not sharing was rather rude of me. Okay. Is that working? Yes. And we are seeing just the whole uh, picture, right? Yep. yep. And we're seeing your slide and you. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> if if I if I do a uh, something disappears again, please speak up. It's uh, I can't really tell from here. Okay. So uh, the first thing in our outline is something with. Di about diversity and risk terminology. So we have terms like um, risk analysis is one of the terms. We have risk assessment is another term. And risk analysis can include risk assessment or risk assessment can be taken to include risk analysis. It depends on what kind of field you're working in. And then there's also risk management and risk management by ISO would include both risk analysis and risk assessment, but risk analysis by most technical risk analysts includes both risk management and risk assessment. So you can see that there's kind of abundant ability to get confused in this area. We're going to try to uh, clarify some of that. In the field of risk analysis, it, risk analysis is broadly defined to include risk assessment, risk characterization, risk communication, risk management, and policy relating to risk. So it includes all of those parts. It includes risk management in the sense that it offers a higher level perspective, kind of a meta level view of whether risk management is actually designed to fulfill uh, what it's striving to do. So that can be subject to analysis. So in most of the world that I work in, risk management is a part of risk analysis. So like a set of Russian dolls, the risk analysis is the encompassing part and risk management is uh, a smaller kind of technical aspect of the whole. Now in ISO 31000, which is one of the big systems globally. There's other <laughs> systems proposed by uh, COSO or the Committee of, um, uh, or I forget exactly what it is, but it, it's another uh, global standard. Uh, they'll often include risk assessment and analysis as a part of their whole. Interestingly, ISO 31000 is not really applied to technical risks like nuclear reactor safety, transport safety, or those sorts of things. It's really something that was developed by management consultants to help them uh, get in and help uh, companies, organizations. So for them, risk management includes risk analysis, and it's kind of the larger doll that contains the smaller part that's risk analysis. And it's, uh, so I just share this with you partly so that you see that there can be different perspectives on the whole and how the parts contribute to the whole. So if you sometimes get confused, you're not the only one, almost everybody does. Now let's look at something else that's not necessarily related, but interesting. If we consider risk assessment and risk management, and then consider that both can be rather simple in their nature. So a simple sense of risk assessment might be looking out the window, seeing some rain clouds, and then going over to your television and checking the weather report or your smartphone or whatever. And that would be counted as risk assessment in a simple sense. Risk management might just be pulling out an umbrella to make sure that you're covered in the event 
of rain that your risk assessment advised you is a good chance. But it can also be very complex. It can involve um, all kinds of equations and data and evidence relating things. And in this picture, this from the COSO uh, risk management standard, it, it can inform many layers from strategic through reporting to uh, tactical at many levels from senior management through to uh, frontline workers. And then from many conceptual slices through objective setting, event identification, risk response, and so on. So we've got a big range for both risk assessment and risk management, where they can be either uh, simple or anywhere on a scale through to complex. And of course, we always want to make things as simple as possible or as simple as useful and possible, but no simpler, right? Because then we run into trouble. So let's um, just thinking of this kind of degree of sophistication, let's consider some degrees of risk awareness and understanding that are out there. One of the ones that I quite like is this watch out and be careful. I mean, it's really just the most basic thing that you tell your kids when they're crossing the street or whatever. It's also been picked up by ordinance workers who remind themselves to always be careful. That is, don't drop any bombs or while you're making them or that sort of thing. But this kind of approach can get uh, really over applied and become less useful. So we have questionably useful advisories like this sign has sharp edges. In a little more sophistication are what we would call basic checklists. So Actually, they can be extremely useful. Whenever I travel anywhere, I'm always comforted by the fact that the pilots, even though they have tremendous skills and knowledge about what they're doing, they rely on checklists to make sure that there's gas in the tank and, uh, you know, the engines are turned on and all that kind of stuff. They really do stick to checklists because they can be exceedingly useful. Surgeons use them as well to make sure that everything that they pick up and put in or near the patient actually comes out before they close the patient up. It's uh, So I, I'm not one to mock checklists. They're really useful. Going further, we can have something that's like a scored checklist. So there we have a list of, in our case, it would be risks, and we score them in certain ways. Perhaps how much of the collection is affected, um, how quickly will that effect happen, and that sort of thing. In this scoring of lists, we can then produce these commonly seen kind of risk matrix uh, uh, well, yeah, it's a risk matrix <laughs> that uh, distinguishes between what we consider low probability and low impact from what we'd consider medium or then high probability and high impact. At going even further, we get into what's called quantitative risk analysis and sometimes called probabilistic risk analysis. It's really the same thing. And that's the approach that's taken in our cultural property risk analysis model. And we'll be talking about that um, quite, quite a bit further. So it looks like it can be really quite complicated, but it's built on a foundation of very simple modeling assumptions. So it can become reasonably easy to step through uh, in a systematic way. So, so. okay. Now for our brief history of conservation, in the 1980s, uh, the agents of deterioration were developed as a framework by the Canadian Conservation Institute. Really, Stefan Mikowski kind of uh, uh, promoted this. Agents of deterioration were taught at Queen's, um, but 
he kind of extended it and included things like uh, criminals or thieves and vandals, fire, uh, some of the other things that aren't so normally thought of in preventive conservation. And now, partly spurred on by that, the Canadian Museum of Nature started exploring risk analysis as a way to uh, identify the most significant preventive conservation issues in our diverse collections. In the 1990s, we had first early versions of the CPRAM, Cultural Property Risk Analysis, presented, for example, at the IIC Congress in 1994, one of the earliest uh, presentations of a risk approach to preventive conservation. In the 2000s, we had our, whoa, sorry, had our formal uh, publication of the CPRAM in 2003. That book can be downloaded from our website. Uh, we had our Canadian Museum of Nature and Canadian Conservation Institute established a partnership to bring the uh, learnings that we had achieved at our Museum of Nature to CCI's initiatives in this area. Then the establishment of CCI ECROM and the Dutch RCE uh, partnership to work on risk management, risk assessment. And then our Culture CPRAM, I'll keep with the uh, abbreviation, we developed a criteria for demonstrating a degree of comprehensiveness, which is really essential for uh, well, a lot of things that you might want to do with a risk analysis model. You need to have some uh, um, evidence-based documented understanding of how comprehensive you're being. In the 2010s, QuizScan was published and applied, and we'll be talking about that somewhat. ABC method was published and applied, uh, and we'll be presenting on that as well. And the CPRAM continued to be applied and refined progressively as we went along. And then it was vetted by the Society for Risk Analysis, Risk Analysis Quality Test. It's uh, important, I think, whenever we adopt methods from a different field, that we subject ourselves to scrutiny by that field to make sure that we're not kind of making mistakes. Uh, so it's important that we uh, peer review publications within the field that we're venturing into and that sort of thing. Now, in the 2020s, just most recently in the last few years, Maya and I have really developed some interesting new aspects of CPRAM to where we can inform all relevant decision makers in an organization of how their decisions and their choices in resource allocation influence the risk to collections so they can understand that from their own perspective. And then we've also developed a way of understanding what proportion of the total risk to a collection is associated with use and what would simply be there due to the sheer existence of the collection, whether it's used or not. And it seems to me that that's such an important thing if as preventive conserv conservators, we're going to make recommendations on whether uh, use with a degree of risk is appropriate or not, then we want to know is, are we talking about a significant increment in risk or just a tiny nudge in, in the total risk that would be there anyway? If we don't know that, then it, it's hard to uh, be very credible. Now, what I really wanted to talk about was the idea of fit for purpose, because we're going to be talking about three systems, QuizScan, ABC, and um, uh, CPRAM. And they're not interchangeable. They're, they were never kind of designed or developed to be interchangeable. And yet our field seems to have kind of arised at a bit of confusion there. So what we're going to try to do is make sure that we get the right system into the right context, the triangle system into the triangle context, and so on. So 
that, oh, and I should thank our cartoonists. Uh, Protect Heritage actually has a, a cartoonist that works with us and, and develops um, a lot of these uh, cartoons for us. Oh, and I should mention it's uh, Sofia in uh, Ukraine. So overviews of the three systems. And just before we get into this, I really want to uh, make sure that we recognize that museums can be small to large. Here we see uh, what's supposed to be the smallest museum in the world, at least they claim to be, uh, in Superior, Arizona, a little mining museum. And at the other extreme is the largest museum with collections held in a single building, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Uh, but there's also everything in between, all different sorts and sizes and shapes and colors and contents of museums. Uh, so there really is quite a broad range. And that right away might tell us that there's probably not a single risk assessment and management approach that's ideal for across that whole range. I'd also like to point out that resources for preserving the collections can vary greatly as well. I'm sure some of you have noticed this from being very scarce to being really plentiful. And that's a significant consideration too, because caring for collections costs money, costs resources, which really can translate as money usually pretty easily. But, um, uh, but also planning for that caring, for taking care of a collection also consumes resources. So, it's what happens if we look at the size of institution along one axis, small, medium, and large, and then the resources available for preservation along the other axis. Well, how would our systems plot in here? I would propose that the QuizScan system is most applicable where there are limited resources readily available for addressing risk to collections, but um, it can be useful in any size of institution from small, uh, tiny, medium, large. I know it's been applied even at the British Museum, can't get much larger than that. Now, ABC approach requires some more substantial resources but it really suits mostly small to medium small museums. And that should become more clear as we work through this. Whereas the CPRAM is really not that useful to a very small museum, but is most useful to medium to large museums. So we'll see if you agree with me, but I, I think that this is a kind of reasonable mapping of where the context in which each of these systems is most useful. So let's look first at QuizScan, which arguably I think is for uh, institutions with at least uh, limited resources that are available with ready access for considering risk to collections, but they could be any size of institution. So this was first proposed by Agnes Brokeroff and Anna Bulo um, for looking where there wasn't much resource available, although it's a huge institution. They, Anna at that time was at the British Museum and she really wanted to work with a team, including exhibit managers, curators, facility managers, to be able to walk through their more than 100 exhibit rooms. This, mag, imagine the magnitude of the issues here, over a hundred exhibit halls in that museum. Um, and to get a bit of a handle on how hazard sources are distributed, as we see in this map, how the vulnerability of collections are distributed in these spaces, how the exposure of those vulnerable collections to the hazard, how that's distributed, and then how the most value in the collection is distributed. So Anna was able to use these kind of concepts to walk around with a team and really 
develop a sense of teamwork about where their priorities are and really address, I guess, some low hanging fruit in high risk areas so that they could uh, make some progress fairly readily in a large complex situation. The system was further developed by Agnes Bart Ankersmith and Frank Lichtering, and no doubt some of their other colleagues at the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, where they took this idea of mapping which was done in a physical sense for application at the British Museum exhibits, and then applied in a more conceptual sense to parts of collection to highlight those significant chunks of collections that might be at high risks from a particular hazard or agent. And just one example might be if a museum has large, many diverse collection units, but one of those units is on nitrate and acetate films, then probably that unit is going to be at a fairly kind of urgent, well, assuming it's not in cool or cold storage, it's probably going to be uh, a priority for risk treatment. So moving on from uh, quiz scan now to look at ABC, where arguably it, um, well, it can apply in, in a range of ways. For some small museums, if you want to sort out a few recommendations, it can be really quite quick. As you move into larger museums with more diverse collections, it can get start to get somewhat complicated and then becomes on the same scale as CPRAM for the resources required to uh, come up with some results. So now, just to back up a second, when I talk about large resources, I want to remind us we're talking about a huge range of museums and the range of resources that are available if we don't take a very narrow focused view of what preventive conservation is. If we're not just thinking of how much budget there is for monitoring equipment for um, uh, say pest traps for you know dust monitoring uh, things like that but we want to include some really important features like the building has a roof and the roof needs to be maintained and that costs money occasionally replaced it has uh, doors with locks on them all that needs to be managed the access to rooms it has security guards contribute greatly to the preservation of collections. Every large institution is investing large amounts of resources in care of collections. It just doesn't all stream through a preventive conservation function, or at least as that function is defined in most museums. But I, arguably, we can change that, and, and I think we can. In any case, as we talk about either ABC or CPRAM, large, medium and large museums do have medium and large amounts of resources that are being applied to preservation. There's still the question of how much resource is put into the guidance of those expenditures to, in my experience, it tends to be quite low compared to the complexity of the challenge. And I just want to talk a, a bit about ABC. I haven't really worked with it for oh, 10, 15 years now. So um, I'm sure there's people attending here who could uh, uh, clarify some things if I misspeak, and I invite you to do offer clarifications. So ABC is uh, published uh, and developed really by CCI and ECROM, along with some other partners who were involved. It combines concepts from ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, as described by the ISO or the COSO frameworks, and from CPRAM that really got us into measuring risk to collections. It's done from the perspective of consultants or advisory institutions. It's really a risk scoring systems, system 
And it asks for scores to indicate how often or how soon will I say things happen, but I really mean something that could cause damage or loss to the collection. How often, if it's a, an incident that's repeated, or how soon, if it's a process, will, will this happen to some degree? Now that gets meshed with how much value of affected items will be lost with this thing, just forgive me for saying thing, but say adverse event will happen. How many, how much value of the affected items will be lost? And then the third one, this is where we have A, B, and C. So this is A, B, and now C is how much of the collection. And in the case of ABC, they map relative value, considering all kinds of values, whether it's aesthetic or information or, um, uh, well, whatever, monetary, any kind of value you can think of that you might be concerned of. But they map together the value distribution with item counts and come up with what they call a value pi. Interestingly, in CPREM, there's another sense of value pi where we distribute the kinds of value that each collection unit has. So we use our pi to divide up, uh, say, between aesthetic, scientific, historic, that kind of thing. Uh, anyway. It's all kinds of pies for all kinds of people. Uh, now, one of the um, advantages and disadvantages, just like people, systems tend to have the same characteristic that is an advantage in some perspectives and a disadvantage in other perspectives. I, I think we're all familiar with that. Well, the ABC approach was set up to have simple scale scores. So these are scored by as say one, two, three, four, five, allowing for half steps where that makes sense. But that tends to lead to what what uh, decision makers call high fluency judgments. We're always given the option of, if we get a little frustrated or tired in thinking deeply, we can say, well, that's a two or that's a three. Um, it's easy to kind of revert to uh, what's called a high fluency judgment, just something that's easy and say, oh, I'm tired of thinking, I'm gonna make this a three or something. So. That is actually really helpful if you're, like, say, writing a report on a conservation survey and you kind of quickly want to sort out priority among recommendations. It's really pretty helpful to have some high fluency ways to do it. But if you're wanting to demonstrate accountability for wise preservation decisions and you need to link evidence quantitatively with your measures of risk, then having high fluency is actually a disadvantage. Uh, we need to be forced to think clearly through a well-defined risk, some clear evidence, and what the uh, consequence is. So anyway, there's some, um, uh, okay, and then jump back to uh, small to large museums. And now for ABC, let's replace the very large museum because it really does become quite difficult to apply in large complex settings, but let's replace it with a medium sized museum. In these situations, our field has developed this way of working where we do risk management in a kind of con command and control system. So what I mean is your medium or small museum is going to get in, in the US, it's probably a CAP funded conservator to look at the situation and come up with a set of recommendations for improving the preservation system. Now that set of recommendations goes to the director of that museum and it becomes like their 10 commandments. It's literally their commands for improving preservation. And then they need to enact that through a command and control 
kind of approach. Uh, now, so just as an example, I guess I could have gone through this. You might visit one of these uh, museums and say, oh gosh, guys, you really need to improve kind of the physical protection of your objects. We anticipate breakage in your future. Or here, National Museum of Ireland, guys, this one of yours from your website. Thank you for making that available. This uh, military coat that has been light faded as seen by the waist belt and the shoulder strap protected areas. So our consultant is going to make, and it could be a consultant as in the States, in Canada, it might be CCI doing a, a survey and report for an institution. Certainly uh, controlling light levels and durations is going to be an issue. And these days, you might even talk to them about uh, glazing over artwork so that we're not uh, getting soup in our paintings and stuff like that. So I'm going to move on now to talk about CPRAM a little bit. And um, again, oh, OK, there was one slide I didn't quite fix. But just to remind you, I think for as we get into medium to large institutions, the resources required for a full implementation of ABC and CPRAM are, are comparable. And they are available if a broad view is taken of preservation. So now I'm going to replace the small museum where CPRAM really is not um, that applicable with a medium-sized museum. And, oh, now that wasn't quite right, was it? I think I should have done just a titch more fixing in here. Um, now, so I'm going to go on and talk about CPRAM, though. Like any risk analysis approach, defining Context and scope is critical, but the CPRAM goes further to require a clear definition of a goal and a structure for comprehensive risk identification. In the risk analysis field, it's known as a theory of scenario structuring. It's, you need to uh, specify what your formal method for doing this is going to be. So for our goal, imagine this collection of 25 objects. You've probably all seen this before, but we define our goal as carrying that collection forward in time by 100 years with ideally no unnecessary damage or loss. Now, in reality, stuff is going to happen over 100 years. Perhaps a couple of the objects just aren't in the collection anymore after 100 years. We might not know if they're stolen, misplaced, sent on loan, not returned, or whatever. But clearly, as shown by the arrow here, this is a deviation from the goal. And that is how we define a risk. It's a deviation from a goal. And before I forget, this 100 years is not arbitrary at all. A hundred years leads to what, it, what economists would call a 1% social discount rate. That is as much as we could ever convince any federal government to invest in uh, something with a delayed benefit. Now that could be something like medical research where the benefits arise later in time. It could be uh, education where the benefits to society from that arise later in time, or it's preservation of collections where the benefits arise later in time. Now, another part of the collection may be on permanent exhibit and fade out. Clearly, that's another departure from our goal, so another defined risk. And then there's the chance of a random, possibly catastrophic event. We see that as another departure from our goal, so clearly it's going to have to be another defined risk. So setting 100 years as a goal is, is uh, a really significant aspect of CPRAM. Um, now, we also, uh, as ABC and uh, and then uh, QuizScan went on to do, we we came up with the idea of combining an agent of change. And now you notice I I change. <laughs> 
from uh, talking about an agent of deterioration to an agent of change, because the agent of change is, is a much better term for thinking in a risk-based way. Deterioration connotes something that tends to be progressive, and it leads to some misunderstandings in how risk assessment results are interpreted. Change can be a continual process, a sporadic incidence, or just the chance of, of a huge change at some point in time. So we do stick with agent of change. It was first uh, suggested, I think, by uh, Matthew Sterlich, uh, Joel Taylor, and May Kazar in one of their papers, but I, th I think it's a very good idea. But the agent of change is based on CCI's 10 agents of deterioration, uh, the uh, uh, physical forces, uh, fire, water, thieves and vandals, uh, insect pests and vermin, uh, pollutants, light, in adverse uh, temperature, we call it, sometimes called incorrect temperature. But I think, again, from a risk perspective, we're concerned about adverse outcomes. So we focus on adverse temperatures, adverse, uh, whoa, I better speed up, <laughs> adverse relative humidity, and then dissociation. We consider three types of risk, something that's rare, we define as less than one in a hundred years, um, in frequency, something that's sporadic, maybe every few years, every few decades, something gets dropped or something like that. It's a sporadic incident as opposed to a rare event. And then something that's a continual, like this wear on the blue jeans that seems damaged to me, though my daughter would probably pay more for them. Uh, and we combine these to get at what we call a generic risk. So a fiscal forces as a type one, that is one of our defined uh, generic risks. Fiscal forces type two is another generic risk uh, that could be dropping something. The fiscal forces type three, another generic risk could be a poorly supported spear or basket. But a generic risk is tends to not be quantifiable. We need to get more specific to be able to quantify. And we define specific risk based on the source of the hazard, where it's coming from. Is it a river flood? Is it a, a rainfall flood, a plumbing flood, that sort of thing? The path, how does the water get to the collection? And then the effects on the collection. So as an example, fiscal force one, earthquake could is a hazard, but it can act in a number of different ways. In this case at the Smithsonian, the Washington earthquake caused a shelving failure. I don't know if you can see here, but the earthquake restraint bars just popped off the shelf and then the jars fell on the floor and broke. So that's a shelving failure leading to uh, breakage and damage. But earthquake can also topple tall um, objects as it did in this uh, Christchurch earthquake causing damage. So it's important that we uh, define a number of specific risks. Uh, so they might be specific risks one, two, and three. We help ensure that we're being comprehensive by progressing through a uh, number of specific risks until we're quite sure that we're looking at things that are really small compared to something that's been um, defined above. So that gives us some confidence in our, in our uh, comprehensiveness. Now, this is really just talking about how to name risks. The fancy word for it is taxonomy, or that's just how to give a name to a risk. We could have a fiscal force type one dash three for specific risk three. More significant can be, how do we disentangle some risks that uh, tend to be somewhat mixed up? The fancy word for that is ontology. How do we sort out the ontology? It's more difficult, but it's still possible. Just as an example, say paper that becomes embrittled and then suffers mechanical damage, well, that's really a function of, of adverse temperature, adverse relative humidity, adverse uh, contaminants as in acidity 
electricity in the paper. And then it's ultimately some physical force that's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Now, I'm going to start moving pretty quickly now because I seem to have gone a bit more slowly than I intended in other places. Our CPRAM does analysis as a risk ranking and screening exercise. We use what's called the hierarchical holographic modeling uh, developed by Yakov Haynes and others uh, for our comprehensive risk identification. And our goal is to inform decision makers. Now, this is kind of our the picture that we're used to seeing with CPRAM. We call it the forest of how generic risks affect different collection units. I still like it as a picture because it conveys to management that preventive conservation is not a simple trivial thing. It's pretty complicated uh, if we want to know which risk to which collection unit is a priority for addressing. Now, fortunately, we see that this covers a huge range. What we considered plausible risks to uh, evaluate, they range from about one or nearly one, 0.3 actually, 30%, down to a part per million. So it's like a million to one scale. And that tells us that when we're measuring risks, we're not interested in a fourth decimal place kind of change, but we're interested in, is it a part per thousand or a part per 10,000. Now, having said that, we still pursue the numbers with rigor. We really strive to get the numbers right because that forces us to look for clear evidence and to think very clearly about how we're using that evidence. So we pay a lot of attention to the numbers, but we take them a bit lightly when we're done. And now we can use this forest, we can just look at it in profile and we can see, well, how are the risks distributed by collection units? And I'll ask you now to just ignore the numbers. The numbers don't matter very much. Oh, okay, anyway. What really counts is the shape of the distribution. Have we been able to identify collection units that are at much higher risk than other collection units? That is really the significant part. And we can come out the other side and look at the risk distribution by generic risk. And again, I'd ask you to just don't worry about the numbers or even which the generic risks are, but just get this idea that we can identify this kind of distribution where there's many risks that are, are essentially zero. They shouldn't be our concern. If we're spending emotional and political resources to deal with them, then we're really wasting our resources. Uh, now, these this distributions are known as Pareto distributions. The classic one is the 80-20, therefore the 80-20 rule where 80% of your productivity is through, uh, achieved in 20% of your time. And some that's what we most commonly see. And Moy and I have worked with dozens of institutions doing hundreds of collection units. We always see this kind of distribution. Sometimes it's more steep, like a 90-10 rule, especially if there's a single huge risk, like a fire or something like that. If it's a large institution that's done a lot of work in preservation, they tend to be down closer to 70-30. What we virtually never see is something that's closer to 50-50, where any of these risks could be most significant and you couldn't change the overall risk significantly without addressing a lot of them. So let's just come back to our picture here. Now we've And yet this risk profile is, is influenced by many, many people. It, it's the facility manager, the conservator, the collection manager, the registrar, the IT manager. Um, yeah, we mentioned security. Just a lot of people, maintenance people, they're all influencing the degree of risk to collections. And just given an overall profile or an overall ranking for an institution doesn't inform them of that. Now we get to 
do we want to control? Do we want to exercise a command and control system? Let's think about that. We can only control a fairly limited amount. We're able to influence quite a lot more if we choose to influence rather than control. But inevitably, there's a much larger realm where we just have to accept what's happening. We're not able to either control or influence, and we just accept that. Now, of course, being human, I want to control everything. Um, that way, I don't have to fuss about influence, and I don't have to accept whatever I don't like. But a large organization is not going to let me get away with that. In fact, my buddy in the next cubicle is not going to let me get away with that. So let's just back up here and say we release how much we're trying to control and instead use that effort to increase our ability to influence. In that way, we can greatly reduce what we have to accept without influencing and what we need to uh, kind of burn up our resources trying to control. So that is what we've strived to do with our CPRA. And now I want to thank the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. This their overall risk profile derived just a few years ago. And again, remember that now we're not really sure um, how different parts of the museum are controlling these risks. So one thing we can do with the risk analysis model within CPRAM is sort this out. So we can look at, well, collection management. What can you influence? And we see it's the second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh risks that they can most are within their ability to influence. Conservation, what can you influence? Well, it's the third uh, fifth and seventh risk, it's largely light on permanent exhibits in temporary exhibits and contaminants, both in storage and exhibits. But who's controlling this top risk? This museum has two frozen tissue collections that are, are very significant to them. And the, the collection management and conservation crew has developed very good emergency procedures so that they can well handle any power interrupt that lasts a day or two. Uh, they're well set up for dealing with that with no loss in collection value. But we're aware that the chance of a vast region within North America suffering a power failure due to some, uh, some common mode failure, like a solar storm knocking out satellite communication. Then all these networks can't communicate, they overpower things, burn out transformers. We have to anticipate in the coming decades that there will be a multi-state, multi-province power failure that lasts for weeks, not days. Um, so what we really need here is for facility management to provide on-site emergency power to make sure we're protecting those frozen tissue collections. And of course, we can resort these things to uh, give each of those managers in each of those areas their own Pareto-like distribution and ask them to work on that. So what does this mean for preventive conservation as we're moving forward? We're always going to need some uh, consultants and advisory institutions offering some recommendations that will be taken as risk management by command and control. But for medium to larger organizations, that's just not a useful way to work. In fact, it really is crippling, I think, the um, stature of preventive conservation when we try to do that. What we need to do instead is to work on risk management through informing decision makers. Oh, okay, and I was just going to change that to this slide. So uh, QuizScan can apply across that whole range. ABC is more for smaller to medium-sized museums. CPRAM is more for medium to large museums. But our field is going to have to grapple with this idea that we have two different kinds of roles. And I think it's time we started discussing that. So. 
but we can do it now uh, with a good risk model. Thank you for your attention. Poof. Sorry, Brad, I ran a bit longer than I meant to. Yeah, you've never done that before. Uh -huh. um, does anyone have any questions they would like to pose for Rob? You can either type them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask away. No clear as mud. Well, yeah, while we wait um, to see if anyone has any questions, Rob, I had a question. Um, mm -hmm. The quiz scan was something new to me when you talked about it um, this last spring in your course. And I found it really interesting. It's why I asked you to do this presentation because um, uh, my question is, if you've never done a risk analysis of your institution, um, would QuizScan be the place to start? I think it's certainly an interesting um, thing to look at because it gets you into the fundamental concepts in, in a kind of fairly easy way. But, um, but, you want to graduate from that kind of reasonably quickly if you can. But if if you can't, then that's fine. You know, for for uh, the British Museum, it's um, uh, Anna, while she was there, desperately tried to get them to adopt a, a risk assessment and management strategy across the whole institution. But it, it's very difficult in large organizations. We've been working with the Smithsonian for, for years. It's very hard to uh, get a huge ship like that to kind of turn and change their approach. So in that case, Anna was able to utilize that QuizScan approach to I think affects some really good uh, positive outcomes in reducing risk to certainly exhibits they were looking at. It was my understanding from our discussions that um, one result of doing a quiz scan on your institution might be that you find out that you really don't need to go further than that, um, which would be good to know before launching into ABC or CPRAM. Yeah, it's 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 possible, absolutely. And I I brought up that example of um, having, say, film-based collections on on um, on uh, cellulose ester uh, bases, where we have to expect that they're going to deteriorate, and you know, over a time of a hundred years or so, it's going to be a significant risk. So, if that leads you to a strategy that you have the opportunity to fulfill, then yeah, that may be the, the thing to do. A lot of risk management can depend as much on opportunity as it does on assessed quantitative risk. And that's one of the reasons we felt it was so important to get the decision power into the hands of people like a facility manager so that they could see how the choices that are available to them will more or less positively affect the whole institution's risk profile, because they're the ones that are aware of opportunities, right? They'll know if they're uh, approaching the time for a recapitalization of an air handling system. They, they know these kinds of things and that are just not known to preventive conservation. And I think we shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to uh, issue kind of commands that, to tell these other uh, professionals how they should be doing things in, in a way that just... Um, kind of short circuits their ability to use their knowledge of the systems that they're managing, of opportunities that are available to them, and so on. We do now have a couple of questions in the chat, um, so I will read the first one. Rob, I'm wondering how you think institutions would be able to tackle something like a multi-week power outage, especially with modern reliance on HVAC in vaults, but also frozen tissue collections. It's hard to imagine having uh, even enough fuel for generators for tissue collections in that case. Yep. No, ab absolutely. That, that's a, a good point. And I think for that kind of thing, we need to turn to people who 
I, I mean, it would be presumptuous of me to say I have the expertise to solve that question for you. Um, I'm really not sure how it would be done. It's the kind of thing that I think we'd rely on our facility managers to understand how hospitals are preparing for that kind of thing, be, because for sure they will be. This is um, the, the trouble with our power distribution systems is that we can keep the bills to or keep what I'm paying for electric power to my house low by having a more fragile overall system. So there's kind of competing priorities there. There's keeping the cost of the consumer low, but that results in increased fragility of the system to a massive failure because it's just hard to get the resources for that when it's something that's uncertain, may happen 20 years from now or 40 years from now. Who wants to pay 30% more on their electric bill to cover off that kind of thing? Yeah, I think part of it is we need more intelligent um, systems. Um, we need the ability to control where the power is going so that we can choose where the most critical places are to get the power that we have available. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Okay, we have another question uh, coming all the way from Australia. Uh, thank you for joining us this early in your morning. What do you see as the biggest challenge to get large institutions on board with risk management? Um, it's... Uh... To, to my mind, the biggest challenge is um, denial in senior management and governance, like a board of trustees, that collections suffer loss of value over time. It, there's just a, a, a block of denial about that. We've seen it so strikingly in the kind of British Museum recent incidents of discovering up to 2,000 items uh, have been internally stolen from their collections. Uh, I don't know if, if you guys have seen that on our Protect Heritage website, I did a blog on museums have got to get over being shocked all the time by this. It's It arises out of a denial that there are ongoing losses. Uh, one might hope that the, uh, well, the director of the British Museum has stepped down, that the new director, if he wants to keep his job, um, might adopt a more risk management approach to looking at risk to their collections, it would seem sensible to me. But, you know, it they probably won't because it's... Um, it's not the tool that they're familiar with and that they have at hand. For them, the risk management is much more of a political issue. It's, it's dealing with the politics of, of the issue arising. So it's a real challenge. What worked for us at the Canadian, of, uh, Canadian Museum of Nature, um, gosh, I think almost 30 years ago now, was presenting to our board of trustees the results of our risk assessment where we would talk about the number of item equivalents lost. So when we consider that we might lose an entire item out of the collection, say to misfiling or something, that we would consider equivalent to having a 10% loss of value in 10 other items. We call each of those things one item equivalent lost. In that way, I was able to present to our board of trustees that our collections are not static. What exists, in, they're growing certainly, and they're being developed by research on them that enhances the value in them. But the existing collection as it sits now is losing value um, over time. And it, it's inevitable. We never get to zero risk. There's always going to be some loss in value. When you can break through that denial of wanting to think that nothing bad is happening, then you can get the kind of high level support that can lead to uh, effort in, in, well, what are we going to do about that? Are we going to do a risk assessment that will tell us what really is most important? 
<laughs> um, D. Stubbs Lee asks, can you recommend any good published studies on how risk management theory can be applied to a large scale museum collections move? Um, oh, man. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, no mm -hmm. way. Uh, well, not so much on a large scale. And actually, Evelyn Error from uh, CCI is with us, I think, if she's still here on here. She might have um, some ideas on what's available. There's um, uh, to, to us here. I know over time we have been involved in some. In working with the CPRAM, we, when we're addressing risks associated with a move, we just start ignoring type one risks because the time of the move project is quite short sure. for those chance events to occur. So they're going to be small. And then we ignore type three risks because the progress of a deterioration is going to be quite small over the short time, hopefully, you know, a matter of a year or two or a few years for the move, they're quite small. So we really focus on the type two risks. And then we uh, look at that set of type two risks and question, is this applicable to a move uh, or, or not? Or would it just stay the same? In that way, we can narrow down from Oh, we typically start with what uh, Moya could correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe 130, 140 uh, specific risks. But we can quickly narrow down to uh, maybe 50 uh, type 2 specific risks and then move related, maybe 30 uh, type 2 specific risks. And that really allows us to focus in. Everything that's done in CPRAM is done sequentially in terms of understanding what we can ignore. Otherwise, the challenge of looking at all of this information just becomes overwhelming. So it's very much been developed so that we constantly uh, push aside things that we can demonstrate are not going to be important. So I don't know if that's helpful. Evelyn might, uh, if you want to jump in, Evelyn, do you have some other suggestions? Um, I have nothing at the moment that I could say that specifically addresses the question, um, but I'm aware that it is useful to keep in mind. Sorry, I can turn on my camera. Um, <laughs> oh, that uh, often the collection move itself is an opportunity to address some of the underlying risks. And so just by having those eyes on the collection and, you know, you know, having to methodically go through the process of packing, um, you're going to be detecting a number of things and thinking critically about what you want to implement in the future. Um, there is um, a presentation that was given at IIC, which I know Rob was at as well, uh, about a collection move that um, was done in Japan, where they were able to demonstrate that through their uh, process of packing and moving and the reorganization that they did as part of it, they were able to better ride out uh, an earthquake event. Um, so the spaces that they had gone through that process were less affected by that earthquake than those that hadn't. So I don't know whether that helps, it doesn't totally answer the question, but maybe adds to the conversation. Absolutely, it's a, a really good point to bring up and that is uh, you know, something that we always try to achieve, you know, as a guiding principle, as we're preparing for the move, can we do something that has permanent benefit rather than just a temporary uh, fix for the move and then has to be undone? Mm. But I, I'm sure that's, Deep in your mindset, though, D. <laughs> to the, to I, uh, that it's achievable. Well, I can attest that this is, uh, and Lori and various other people I've talked to over the years, this is, uh, uh, you know, we've been preparing for a move for about 20 years and, and now it's imminent, but the way it's rolling out has no relationship whatsoever to anything that we had, you know, previously planned for or recommended. Um, you know, it's, uh, Case of the fox, you know, in the hen house. <laughs> so, right, right. However, 
Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed. I mean, uh, uh, to Evelyn's point, it is an opportunity to, uh, you know, touch and handle every every single thing in the collection, which is, you know, enormously useful. It's also enormously stressful because, of course, it's being done on a very short time scale with very minimal space and people and budget and materials and all of those sorts of things. But it's it is an opportunity to at least on some level address some issues. And the other thing that I've noticed is our CEO is. Uh, he's got past management on the mind right now. We're, we're for those of you that aren't familiar at the New Brunswick Museum, we're um, scattered across five buildings, all of which are very problematic from a facilities point of view. Um, none of which were purpose built for us. We've been trying to have a new facility built for quite a while. We're actually on plan number forty-five right now in the last twenty-five years because successive governments have, you know typically every time there's an election and we get a new government, they they question the decisions of the previous government as they should. But usually it takes a little while to kind of get a new slate of players at the table up to understanding what's going on. And, you know, anyway, Groundhog Day over and over and over. But <laughs> I say guardedly optimistically, they have announced uh, that there will be an expansion of the building that is currently our, used for collection storage and conservation lab and that sort of thing. And that will expand to include an exhibit space and so on. Whether or not it happens, I don't exactly know. They haven't broken ground yet. They're talking opening in 2026 and it hasn't been fully planned yet. In the meanwhile, we are moving to a building that is an old car parts factory that is going to be used as our interim space. Now I'm hearing maybe not so interim, maybe more long-term, but you know, various things happening. But we're not only packing the collection uh, for protection during the move itself, but it will be largely packed up and more or less inaccessible for however long we're in our interim building during construction. So there's a, a lot of things that are not the way I'd envisioned. I had sort of thought we would, you know, have a destination that was a finished building and move at once and that sort of thing. And it's far more complicated than that. Um, but uh, we're making a little bit of headway. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Lots of prayers, as they say. Uh, it's a challenge. We send our send good thoughts to you. Pete. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you're alone in those situations, T. No, unfortunately, no, unfortunately, not at all. Um, we have another question here. Which which risk management system do you think has the capacity to deal with climate change impacts, or are they all able to respond as well as each other? Oh, that's a, a really great question. It's um. Oh boy, it's, uh, I'd like to say that they all could, but um, a difficulty, well, except QuizScan uh, doesn't really look at all into the future. When we look in the future, we need to apply something called a social discount rate. And it can get kind of complicated, but essentially it's saying the existence of our collection through the year 2024 is more valuable to us today than the existence of that same piece of collection through the year 2124. So a year of value delivered 100 years from now has to have less value to us than uh, the value delivered just next year. Now, how we deal with that in arithmetic is through something called a social discount rate. The CPRAM was designed with a 1% social discount rate, which is I think as far as any government could be pushed to protect things into the future. Um, typically, most governments will level out at, at about 3%. Now, um, while that's quite clear in the CPRAM, the ABC doesn't really um, allow the use of a discount rate. It, um, it has an apparent discount rate that varies over time. If you consider what it tells us about the next 10 years, it's looking at about a 23% discount rate, which is almost similar to what I give my computer or my cell phone. So, you know, that's um, 
that that's really just valuing the immediate future. In the field, it's called hyperbolic discounting. And it's really what kids do at Halloween when they start eating their candy and they might eat it all in a day or two. That right, that's hyperbolic discounting. I want the value delivered to me now. <laughs> and I don't care about a month from now. I know Pop will come visit and give me a bit of money. Um, anyway, so uh I think from that perspective, CPRAM is, is disciplined and structured in the way it looks into the future, whereas uh, the ABC has a variable discount rate over about a 10-year period, maybe 23% is really higher than anyone would put to something like a museum collection. Over 100 years, it drops to 5%. But from my perspective, that's still too high. That's discounting the future a bit too much. But and this is the kind of thing it would be helpful to have a debate among uh, people who are kind of familiar with these questions. Because, I mean, it's a great question you put forward. You know, which system is it best matches our concern about future climate? Um, it's, uh, I, I don't really know how ABC would manage that without uh, clearly addressing social discount rate. I'm gonna jump in and add a little bit to that, which is, with something like that, because with climate change, so much of there's just so much uncertainty about what's going to happen. And events that used to happen once in a hundred years now seem like once every two or three or four years. And so it can be really difficult um, to determine how that's going to change going forward. Um, and with the CPRAM, what we do is we look at past evidence to determine how often has something happened in the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years or whatever, you know, someone's um, career span at a certain institution and what happened during their time there. And then that's what we're able to apply to imagine will be happening in the future. But with climate change, because things are changing so quickly and so in such a way that we can't predict, it can make it really tricky to determine that. Um, even within sort of those parameters that we have, because we can only work with what we know has happened in the past. You know, that's all we have. That's the only evidence we have available to us. When well, things are rapidly changing, it really helps to have thought out the various risks so that when new data comes along, we can adjust the model by changing just that one th thing to see what the result is. Absolutely. That's where we really want uh, to document the evidence well. So when there's new evidence and the evidence, uh, uh, thanks, Moya, but it's not only our past experience, but we can use climate models to understand that um, average temperatures are going to be going up, that storm intensities are going to be going up and things like that. So we can make some adjustments. But I think what Moya was really getting at was the degree to which we choose to incorporate that in our risk model, uh, it depends on the purpose, on, on really what we're doing the modeling for. If it's for um, designing a new building, as, as Moya and I are doing now in Germany, it's for, well, for sure, we want to look at the climate forecast models because it's going to be really important um, to get the building design right. If we're more just looking at um, how we're addressing local issues within an existing building, given the uncertainty in the climate models, we're probably not going to be incorporating that. So context is everything. It depends on what we want to get out of the model. Uh, the idea, I think the, the CPRAM is as close as we can come to an exceedingly simple model. And out of its simplicity comes considerable flexibility to reinterpret it in different ways. But for anyone who's looked at old conservation surveys, old collection surveys, and tried to derive some answers to new conservation questions, you know, that's really tough <laughs> if you don't set up the survey to address specific questions. Same idea with this. Uh, D, uh, Evelyn did drop in uh, the title to that um, talk that she mentioned at IIC. 
Um, Jean Luc Vincent has a question, and by the way, I love your background. Um, are any collection software any good at incorporating risk management, or is it too complex for them to deal with beyond object condition history and UV light exposure and such? A great, great question, Jean-Luc. Thanks for uh, posing that. It's, um, yeah, I, I think you've really hit it with that kind of second question. There's issues that we want to address on a per item basis, and, and those very well fit into a collection management software thing. But for the risk management, we're really looking at uh, the collection as a whole, and then large pieces of the collection. And remember, I talked about doing this uh, um, holographic hierarchical model approach where we're constantly breaking things down. So we break down the collection as a whole into collection units. And then collection units can be in some sub-collection units. Um, and, and we'll just go like that until we get down to, well, what fraction of that unit is actually susceptible to this specific risk? So we're constantly breaking down. And the same idea with the risks, we go through hazards and types of risks, then through to generic risks, specific risks. Sometimes we'll split those up. So it it's very much a top-down hierarchical approach, and it's difficult to, um, to fit in kind of detailed item information into a, informing that well. Although I'm sure that's an area where there's going to be some good developments in the next couple of decades, especially with AI giving us you know, ever better ways to kind of mine information. Adrian seems to agree. Uh, the comment was AI enabled risk modeling. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, for sure. It's uh, it, it's becoming just more and more an issue. AI is going to turn not just risk analysis, but science on its head, actually, as you go directly to machine learning causal chains. And it's, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other topic of discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been really interesting. Uh, and thank you for your um, good questions. Whenever you make Rob think, I love it. Um, if uh, you want to follow us on social media to keep up with uh, blog posts or future webinars, our next one actually will be in early October on community engagement, led by Shannon Palmer out of... Uh, Canberra, Australia. Um, I have dropped in links to our Facebook and LinkedIn if you want to follow us to hear about those things. Um, I also included Rob's email address if you have any more questions for him. And uh, other than that, thank you all for joining us and sticking through the extra time required to answer all of these interesting questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much for Thank everyone, you, everyone joining us.